hello everyone. I'm Sajnya Konka and I'm a solution architect with uh, AISPL. And uh, here I am today talking about making sense of data, data and uh, analytics modernization. Um, I come with 13 plus years of experience. So prior to joining AWS, I was working with a, a multinational bank, HSBC, designing and uh, developing data platforms across on-premise and uh, cloud uh, platforms. So let's uh, dive deep into today's topic. OK, so here's a quick agenda. I'll be talking through the, um, the introduction to data platforms, which is kind of giving you a sense of uh, what data looks like in a growing organization. Uh, well-architected pillars, which is the well-architected framework at AWS the end-to-end -end analytics solution on AWS platform, and what are the services that will help you uh, with the data movement, creating a data lake, and processing uh, the data and uh, to the point that you generate meaningful insights out of the data. And then we'll see some data in action through a demo. And then I'm going to also share a reference material that uh, as a takeaway, which you can uh, which you can uh, reference at a later point of time to build a few demos or look at the pre-built solutions which are available on the AWS documentation. Right, so let's move on. We know uh, data is everywhere and there is more data than people think and it grows at an anomaly, anomalously uh, rapid, uh, uh, anomalously faster rate. So it grows at 10x years. Now, these are certain stats which has been published uh, by IDC. And uh, you can see uh, it says that 10x data grows every year. And it will leave for 15 years. And uh, so the data platforms that you design for your enterprise will have to generate, uh, will, have to, uh, will have to be more uh, efficient to tap this data in the right time to generate uh, for, to generate meaningful insights and uh, to align with your business goals. And uh, scale, and we also understand that it can scale at a much faster rate uh, than what's mentioned here. And who needs this data? So it's, it's everyone, uh, different personas, which can be people within your organization or external parties, third party systems. So there are more people uh, than you think are uh, looking to access this data and tap value out of it. So it can be data scientists, business users, uh, it can be your analysts or uh, uh, applications which are accessing this uh, data platforms through uh, different protocols like REST API endpoints, etc. And there are uh, more and many more requirements for making uh, data available as well. Now, how do we do this? Let's take uh, an example. Uh, I'll be uh, so. This is a data flywheel, which is available on the AWS documentation, which talks about uh, from the point where you generate your data or plug into your data source, which can be a live data source or a historic data which has been collected over time, and which sits in your on-premise or your third-party tools. So you move those data. Uh, and uh, run them on your fully managed uh, databases. Now, these databases need not be a single uh, service, like a relational server, relational database, or it can, it can also be an, a non-relational or a NoSQL DB, which is dealing with uh, the customer uh, inputs or the live inputs that are received from a, a connected user. And so you, you divide distributed data and run them on different databases and then build your data-driven applications before it is consumed by your end users or your third-party services. And then you at a point when you are operational for a certain period of time uh, serving your customers, then you would like to innovate. That, that's where you bring in the machine learning services or the blockchain, and, you, and then you keep the flywheel active again, uh, generating more data. So the data flywheel is designed to meet customer needs based on where they are in their uh, cloud journey. It begins and ends with data and with the integration of new data continuously fueling as it spins. Modern apps and analytic services and machine learning systems create more data than 
that can be stored and managed in the cloud through warehouses and data lake architectures. And that is where it becomes predominantly important that you do not uh, procure your uh, the hardware to maintain and process this data, and rather uh, scale uh, through uh, scale and process your data on the cloud. Okay, let's look at uh, creating a data platform. How does that work? So when we are bringing data from multiple places, which can be uh, both a structured data format or unstructured and also semi-structured formats. Structure refers to a tabular data, which is more in a consumable and readable format. And unstructured, it, it can be with a varying schema uh, or a nested JSON and or a semi-structured data where which needs to be converted and enriched before it turns into a consumable format. So it's essential to bring in this data, clean, prepare, prepare and catalog this data. So that's like generating a schema or a metadata associated with the data that you bring in. Store it in a place which is secure and referenceable and configure and enforce security and compliance practices so your uh, the platform where you store your data is uh, secure and you can allow a layer of governance uh, for both your applications plus the end users and then make it allow allow it to be available for generating uh, real time analytics or uh, batch analytics at the convenience of depending of the consumer endpoints and it's and it's important and it's increasingly essential such that uh, so with with the pace of innovation that we are uh, that we are uh, with it, like, like to incorporate within our organization, it's important that your platform is easy to build, comprehensive and open, and secure, and you have a secure infrastructure that will help you uh, oblige with the regulatory compliance, and also ensure that your uh, customer data is in the safe hands. Right. How do we do this? Let me break it down and make it more simple. So this is a logical architecture of an analytics platform. And uh, as you can see, there are different uh, components involved in the logical architecture. It's a six layer uh, uh, logical, six logical layers where each layer is composed of multiple components. A layer uh, is a component component oriented architecture promotes a separation of concerns and decoupling of tasks and makes each of these layers independently scalable and secure and flexible. Then let's start with the ingestion layer. The ingestion layer is responsible for bringing in the data into the data lake. Uh, it provides the ability to connect to internal and external data sources over a variety of protocols. It can ingest batch and streaming data into the storage layer. And once you bring in the data from your uh, multiple source systems, what do you do? It's the storage layer. The storage layer is responsible for providing durable, scalable, secure, and cost-effective uh, components to store vast quantities of data. It supports storing structured and unstructured data sets of variety of structures and formats. Now, uh, that's also important uh, while you are storing the data. So to understand what is the data type associated with it, and what is the schema that is associated with the data. Uh, so it becomes uh, consumable to the end uh, point. So uh, even when, you, when you're talking about the storage layer, you would see there are uh, three different uh, uh, storage subcomponents, you can say that. So it's, it's the raw zone, it's the uh, clean zone, and the curated or the consumption zone. Now, what is this? Uh, so raw zone is the format in which you receive the data from your source system. And this is a transient area where data is ingested from the source as is. So you read, you can read in it and uh, move it to uh, from the standard storage class to even the archival storage class. So you make it a cost efficient. Uh, so you store your data in a cost efficient manner. The clean zone, which is after the preliminary quality checks or uh, the data from the raw zone is moved to the clean zone for a permanent storage. So here the data is stored in its original uh, in its original format. But after uh, enriching it and making it uh, and removing the uh, the unnecessary or the uh, the junk data which doesn't match with the uh, the schema expected schema, having all the data from the source permanently stored in the clean zone provides the ability to replay downstream data processing in case of errors or data loss. 
and then the curated zone now this is this is a, a data, data layer which is completely consumption ready state and conforms to the organization standards and the data models now this is the area where you would see the data scientists or analysts would like to uh, query uh, the curated zone data uh, in generating meaningful insights uh, of the data that has been brought into the system and next, uh, what you see is the processing layer. The processing layer is responsible for transforming the data into a consumable state through validation, cleanup, normalization, transformation, and enrichment. Now, this is where basically the heart of your application lies, where you're actually converting your uh, incoming data. And in the process, you're also generating uh, the important cataloging or a search layer and uh, providing uh, more uh, providing more information about the absorbed data and storing it in a central metadata catalog right and the consumption layer now we know the consumption endpoints can be anything from analysis methods to including sql batch analytics or bi dashboards reporting ml or your business on the marketing teams or your application endpoints trying to access this data and they can they can that can happen in both real time batch or in um, or uh, or a real real time uh, use case security and governance layer now this is uh, also important which uh, in which uh, it enables you to protect the data in the storage layer and the processing the resources in all other layers so it provides a mechanism for access control encryption network protection and uh, usage and monitoring monitoring uh, so that way, end-to-end, uh, -end, while your data flows through different components of your logical architecture, so secure and governance uh, layers or the services uh, are the services that enable you to uh, allow the uh, secure flow of data until the point it is consumed by the user. Now, uh, we understood what are the different components involved in designing an application for application uh, that will uh, deal with the processing the incoming data. Let's look at some best practices or the guidelines uh, from the AWS platform. Uh, how do we, uh, what, what is it that we suggest to our customer? On the slide, uh, you will see five different pillars of AWS well-architected framework. Now, uh, I, from this point, actually, I'll make a gentle start introducing you to the AWS platform and services. So, well-architected framework, or commonly known as WAR, is, is, uh, a, is a questionnaire that is available on the uh, AWS console. So you can uh, you would see uh, a 52 questions set of questions, which kind of uh, covers these five pillars, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. So uh, that that allow, that is uh, it's normally suggested uh, for the uh, for a customer uh, who's building their applications on cloud to do an, uh, a half yearly or a quarterly review of their application or whenever they go live with a new set of uh, application on cloud to ensure they are adhering to these five uh, the guidelines stated by these five pillars. Now, um, when, you, when, when you incorporate these five pillars, it will help you to produce stable and efficient systems, allowing you to focus on your uh, functional requirements. Now, operation, I'll, I'll talk through each of those as a high level and what do they include. So operational excellence is the ability to run and monitor systems to deliver business value and continuously improve supporting processes and procedures. Security which is a critical pillar, as we all know, as we, we do uh, come across incidents where an application has been compromised or has been, uh, or there's a new threat that is detected uh, and there's a new DDoS attack or a SQL injection uh, that has happened on the application layer. To uh, ensure your application it has, is uh, protected from uh, these uh, threats, so you, should, you need to ensure the ability to protect the information uh, systems assets while delivering business value through risk assessments and mitigation strategies. Now, you could do that with uh, several uh, security uh, and governance layer services which are available on the AWS platform. We're going to talk through them uh, in a while uh, during our presentation. Reliability, ability of a system to recover from the infrastructure or service failures and ensuring your system is completely fault tolerant. 
dynamically acquire computing resources to meet your meet the demand and mitigate disruptions such as misconfigurations or transient network issues performance efficiency now uh, as you start and grow and as your business scales and uh, to align with your business goals your application and your infrastructure stack should be equally compatible uh, to grow and meet the demands of your business need the ability to use compute resources efficiently to meet system requirements and to maintain their efficiency as demand changes and technologies evolve so that's performance efficiency pillar cost optimization now as you scale and grow and also ensure you're meeting the security reliability and other four pillars it is important that your entire application stack is cost efficient right so that's the cost optimization that's and you can achieve that through different uh, um, options that are available on the aws platform and there's also the cost recommendations that you would come out on the cost explorer which constantly keep a tab on uh, your utilization and suggest um, how you can reduce the overall cost uh, keeping your uh, commitment on the compute resources or your storage requirements active right okay so uh, keeping that momentum active let's move on and talk further about how we can build a data lake architecture and analytics on aws so as you see uh, on the left hand side there is the data that is coming in in the different formats and we have touched upon different sources of the data now if we are uh, let's take an example of a mobile uh, application uh, which is um, bring in data from uh, the devices or the sensors and also uh, it's it's interested uh, about uh, when you publish your post on your social media so there are customer clicks and there is an activity that is going on uh, which you would like to capture and would like to add the add on to your uh, and pass on to your marketing team so you understand uh, your brand value and how how is your new feature product feature uh, that is going on uh, the new product feature releases that you would do uh um, how are they received by your end customers so that that's an important set of metrics and uh, what and uh, and it is certainly useful if you get it in a real time fashion right so talking about the different sources uh, so you would have your internal uh, erp systems or your crm data that is coming in through multiple connected endpoints or your channels uh, from where your customers are served and your connected devices so bring in that data and storage uh, in, in the uh, the capture layer or your ingestion layer that is uh, the s3 which is the uh, the cheapest and the uh, durable storage available on the aws platform it's the simple amazon s3 the simple storage service so and use the im and the kms uh, services to ensure you are giving the uh, right access to the right set of folks uh, to perform the minimal activity that they need to uh, to access the data um, for their application right and what do we do uh, here uh, once we store the data uh, we generate a kind of a data uh, catalog which is uh, schematizing the uh, the incoming data and storing the schemas associated with the data on a glue data catalog which is our serverless etl service and once you have the data available on s3 you have a schema available on the glue catalog so you can, it's it's ready to be uh, absorbed or uh, query through end can end user devices which can be your application endpoints or it can, it can be native services on the aws platform uh, taking them to an etl layer uh, managing your cluster through emr and processing the data for a big data processing or, or also taking uh, through a warehouse where your uh, business uh, analysts can uh, run uh, queries on top of the data or also pass it on to your uh, data scientist team to build machine learning models on the existing set of data that you store on s3 right or generate uh, real time dashboards or leaderboards using a visualization service that is the quick site right okay so what are the uh, and taking it slightly further uh, 
on top of the services that you see on the screen, uh, I would like to talk, I'd like to introduce a few other services which are available on the AWS platform, which help you build uh, different sorts of analytical, uh, uh, different sorts of analytical pipelines. Uh, so that, that involves, um, yeah. So moving on, let me introduce you to other set of services which are available on the AWS platform that help you construct uh, different analytical pipelines based on your business need. So we'll start with the, uh, the Discover service, as you see, Glue Crawlers. Now, this is the one that we have spoken about. It's, it's an ETL uh, serverless service, which is, which is based on the Spark framework. And you do not have to write even a, a, a piece of code. So it, it's a, you plug in your source and your destination uh, targets, and uh, it will generate a Python or a, a Scala script for you. A uh, Glue Crawler service, which actually uh, can be connected to your source uh, so source location, which can be your S3 bucket. From where a crawler can be run to generate a schema associated with the data. It's a completely serverless service that uh, you do not have to uh, write even a piece of code. Uh, it will uh, so it's based on the Spark framework, so it will allow you to uh, create. It auto generates a Python and a, or a Scala script associated with the uh, the process or the transformation logic that you would like to apply. And the ingest. So when you talk about ingesting the data, so we we uh, it can be from different places. It can be the streaming data that is coming in through uh, Kinesis streams or the data firehose or the uh, managed Kafka service that is MSK. And if you have your existing databases, which are on uh, on-premises or uh, other third-party services, and you would like to bring in the data into the AWS platform, that is where data mice migration service uh, can help. So it does a table by table copy, allowing you to bring in both your archival and your changed data into the uh, AWS platform. And if you, and the physical uh, devices, which will help you to bring in petabytes to exabytes of data onto the AWS platform, so or into your AWS account, that's Snowball and Snowmobile uh, devices. Direct Connect allows you to create a private hosted connection with your data center. And that's the ingest services. Uh, you store your data in the uh, durable and the cheapest storage option that we have on the uh, cloud platform, that is, S3 and with an S3 now uh, depending on the uh, the state of the data and the consumption or the uh, retrieval patterns you can move your data across different storage layers it can be standard class to uh, the glacier or deep archive uh, reducing the uh, the storage uh, cost associated with the data and you can also store in both uh, NoSQL and the SQL database options that we have on AWS Secure, it's, uh, the IAM allows you to create uh, both groups and roles and uh, create custom roles to ensure the right set of people or the groups get the uh, minimal amount of access to perform the activity. KMS allows you to create, uh, uh, create uh, encryption keys or you bring in your encryption keys which have been using in the other uh, platforms. And Macy to detect uh, your uh, the PII or the critical data associated with your customer, which you would like to secure and uh, save it in uh, your uh, data stores. The CloudTrail and CloudWatch for uh, monitoring and long purposes. Catalog uh, from on the AWS Glue data catalog. EMR Hive Store, which is another option where you can put in your uh, the uh, schema or the catalog associated with your uh, associated with your data sets. Prepare the data. Now there are options where you want to begin with your serverless or uh, go with a cluster where you provide provision a server and uh, ensure uh, you right size your cluster to perform uh, and scale your ETL processing uh, pipelines. Analyze, and this can be done through different ways. It can be building uh, your custom models with SageMaker or uh, managed AI services like recognition, personalize, uh, transcribe, translate, uh, or creating a chatbot on top of the uh, consume or top of the data that is available uh, on your uh, storage services. Or you can also build uh, real-time dashboards with Kinesis uh, uh, data analytics queries. And uh, you can uh, also create log uh, search and uh, 
log search and visualization dashboards with elastic search right and again uh, you can use uh, notebooks which to connect through each of these services uh, to perform interactive queries or uh, transformations at the jobs uh, through the notebook interface that that's at a very high level talking about the uh, services and categorizing them uh, under the analytics uh, umbrella so this is the modern data architecture on AWS, uh, and it's it's a, it's a single uh, slide which will talk about uh, how you can leverage the S3 uh, to construct a meaning construct a data lake, and also extending to the point of creating a data mesh. Uh, as your organization grows, there are different lines of businesses that are relying on the data, or there are external third-party systems who would need access to your internal data. How do you do that? So it starts with Amazon S3. Customers have been building data lakes on S3. It stands as a popular choice. Uh, and there are more data lakes on uh, run on AWS than anywhere else. And it's using uh, Athena, so which is our uh, serverless and interactive query service. It's nothing but a managed presto under the hoods. So you can query your data that's uh, hosted on S3 through Athena without provisioning any server. In addition to the data lake, customers use a combination of our uh, purpose-built databases and analytics services like EMR, uh, Amazon Elasticsearch, which is called the open source, uh, open search service now on the uh, console. You would see the name updated. Uh, Redshift, Amazon Redshift, to ensure that they are using the right tool for their job to get the high performance and scale at the lowest possible cost. And to move the data uh, between the systems, uh, Glue, you can use Glue, which is the serverless data integration service. And finally, you can use AWS Lake Formation. Now, this is a governance tool that will help you manage the, uh, the security and the governance of all the data, regardless of whether it sits in the data lake or it's in any of the purpose-built stores. And in all of these cases, uh, we've, uh, in, in, we've heavily invested in offering best price to performance ratio uh, for each of these services associated. Now, let's dive in by discussing scalable data lakes. It starts with creating data movement solutions, uh, which is like uh, we are bringing in data from multiple places. And how do we do that for both data that is at rest plus the new live data that is getting created at, uh, a con uh, at a customer endpoint, and also bringing in your existing archival data from your on-premise data stores. Right, if you see, these are there are more different ways where you can bring in your data into the data lake. Uh, so you can start with uh, data movement from your on-premise, uh, so you can, it, let's say you have been uh, operating uh, with your on-premise uh, applications uh, with, uh, with an internal uh, storage services. So AWS offers the most comprehensive range of options to help customers to move data from AWS to AWS without any major disruptions and also at a lower Now, If you'd like to uh, move petabytes or exabytes of data from the data centers or your on-premise hosted services, you can use physical appliances like Snowball or Snowball Edge. Uh, and you can also connect, or if you have, if you'd like to uh, host an on-premise application directly connecting to AWS, you can use uh, AWS Storage Gateway or the other choice is you can set up an, a, host, a private network, a dedicated network connection between the customer's network and the AWS through AWS Direct Connect. And you can or, uh, boost long distance global da data transfers using Amazon's globally distributed edge locations with Amazon S3 transfer acceleration. So that will be relying on the, uh, the edge locations uh, that are uh, edge locations at, uh, which are uh, available across the globe. Finally, customers can capture and load streaming data or IoT device with the uh, Amazon Kinesis Data Firehose that can land your data into S3 Elasticsearch service from where your uh, analysts or your existing uh, business users can start querying the data as and when it arrives onto the platform.
The first step is to building a data lake on AWS to move the data to the cloud. Right, okay, let's check what are the uh, data lake and infrastructure and management solutions. Uh, so here that allow you to create a, uh, a secure uh, lake management solutions. This is uh, S3. So what do you do? Uh, so it's it's now we've spoken about it uh, in the previous slides. It's it's uh, a 99. It provides you uh, 11 nines of durability. What does that mean? So it's it's actually you whenever, for example, if you store uh, 10 million objects uh, with Amazon S3, you can on an average expect to incur a loss of a single object once every 10,000 years. So that's like saying it's almost impossible to lose an object which is stored on uh, Amazon S3. It allows global, it has uh, global replication cap uh, capabilities. So you can do uh, and create a highly available uh, storage layer because uh, it, 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 is, it allows for massive parallel, it's massively parallel and scalable and its storage uh, scales independently of compute and it provides a uh, lowest uh, storage costs compared to any other, uh, compared to the other uh, storage uh, choices that are available on the platform. And even you can move across from the standard storage clause to a uh, deep archival storage class, depending on your access and retrieval patterns. Right, so when you create, when you're storing your data on S3, it becomes increasingly important to uh, have a governance layer that will allow you to simplify the simplify the way you manage the data and the access that is uh, access of uh, the data that is stored on in the S3. So lake formation is a service that makes it easy to set up secure data lake in in uh, in a couple of days. So data lake enables you to break down silos and combine different types of analytics to gain analytic uh, to gain insights and guide the better decision business decisions. Um, and uh, creating a data lake with lake formation is as simple as defining data sources and what data access and security policies you want to apply. Uh, in the uh, demonstration as part of this uh, session, I'm going to also show you how we create a lake, how we can create a lake formation on the, on the sample layer that we are going to use in our demo, right? So, uh, it, it allows you, you all, all you need to do is once you create your S3 buckets, you can declare them as part of your uh, uh, AWS S3 data lake. And once you do that, uh, it uh, it'll allow you to create um, uh, access controls in terms of the operations that you would like these users to perform. Either it can be just restricting them, a set of users to just create the databases or update the data tables. And, they, and then separate your uh, users who just need a viewer or a browser access on top of the data. So you can segregate the different roles and ensure uh, each person is just getting the uh, minimal amount of access on the data. And uh, it al allows you to create what is called as uh, data as a product. Now, for, uh, you must have heard about the concept called data mesh. So within an organization, there are different uh, lines of businesses uh, from where data gets generated. And uh, it, you do not want to create data copies across the organization and continue to pay for uh, the copies of data. Rather, you can create a data lake and or uh, create a data as a product. So the end user doesn't need to know where the data is coming from or where he or she is querying the data from. And you ensure lake formation and you can, uh, you can leverage a lake formation to create this uh, data as a product service uh, where you declare all your S3 buckets as part of your data lake, right? And all actions within the data and the usage patterns, uh, data transformation, data classification should be accessible through a central place. And that's exactly what lake formation can do for you. Right, so we have set up our lake and we want to understand and prepare the data, make it turn it into a, 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 a format which can be used by the, uh, the end users or your uh, applications. So how do you do that? 
that that's with the data preparation and the uh, data preparation which can essentially involve uh, transforming merging the data or turning into uh, the right format so say let's say moving it from csv to a parquet format where you're moving it to a warehouse and it would require a columnar data format to support analytics so that's uh, preparing your data before it moves to a consumer layer and that's exactly what glue can do a glue comes with uh, connectors, so it will allow you to connect with any data uh, database that is uh, available on the platform. Plus, also you can connect to third-party services through uh, JDBC or ODBC connectors, um, and that that will allow you to bring in the data from your uh, source system onto the uh, onto your uh, target uh, data store. And while you bring in the data, you can also uh, convert or transform it through glue ETL jobs. And you can also create schemas associated with the data. If you're bringing in unstructured data uh, to, to make uh, to uh, turn into a format where it can be queryable, it's important to associate a schema with that data. That's exactly what a glue crawler can do for you. And uh, it would store a catalog uh, of uh, the schemas in, in a database on the glue data catalog, right? And uh, these can be independent jobs. And also, it will allow you to create what is called as a workflow. That's like allowing an orchestration of all of these jobs. And you can embed triggers at the points where you want, uh, hey, I want my uh, crawler to run after an ETL job is complete. And then, uh, yeah, that, that's an end-to-end -end flow that you can decide with Glue workflow, uh, workflows. Right. Uh, let's look at now. This is these uh, here is uh, one of the customers, uh, which is uh, Equinox Media. So oh, when uh, the pandemic caused worldwide shutdowns, fitness technology company Equinox Media recognized the need uh, to accelerate the launch of its uh, virus service, which is which comprises of a mobile health and a fitness application, and an at home bike. So, and is designed to collect fitness data and provide home exercises with a personalized workout experience that tracks progress and issues unique recommendations based on each user's activity and goals. Uh, so, so, Equinox was able to uh, build their entire uh, serverless platform. So, it's primarily Amazon Athena, Kinesis Data Firehose, and uh, Dynamo. ODB, Lambda, and other serverless services that have enabled them to build a complete uh, recommendations platform, capturing the uh, customer data in a real-time format. And this has actually reduced uh, their overall turnaround time by six months. Uh, so they were able to launch the product six months ahead of schedule. That's exactly what you can do with serverless services, where you just concentrate on your application logic rather than focusing uh, your time and energies on uh, building uh, clusters and right-sizing your nodes, right? This is another example. So one football has grown to become one of the world's uh, most popular digital media platforms for soccer enthusiasts. The company reached 70 million fans a month with new scores, statistics, live streams, and highlights from soccer games around the world. At that, that time, it becomes increasingly uh, important to uh, manage your data that is coming in from these multiple channels. So the company used AWS Lake Formation to rapidly build a data lake and enable uh, uh, self-service analytics. So increasing data availability to internal, uh, internal staff, which can be admin or developer community, and also the uh, users. So that way, the increased data coverage from relevant backend databases uh, has uh, backend databases from six, 30 to 60 percent and increased usage of analytics platform by 40 percent. Right? Uh, that has led to the cut, uh, cut time needed to request and receive the data insights from four to six weeks to just two days. That's huge. Uh, that's what you can do with uh, moving to a completely uh, serverless service. And there are uh, public case studies, which is also available on the AWS documentation, um, talking through the uh, how how, how uh, what is it that they were able to build in a few weeks, and that has reduced their overall uh, turnaround time. Right. 
So we've spoken about ingesting the data. We have spoken about cleansing and preparing the data. Now, what do we do with the data that is available for use or ready to consume? So that's analytic solutions. And as you would see, there are different choices from warehousing to big data processing, serverless data processing through uh, Glue, and uh, interactive query through Athena and operational analytics and real-time analytics. So moving ahead, here uh, is the, uh, this is a slide which is uh, referring to Kinesis. Now there are other uh, choices which are available on AWS, uh, the uh, MSK service, uh, which is the managed Kafka, and uh, with Kinesis, there are uh, options where you can choose from Kinesis data streams, which is a massively scalable and durable real-time data streaming service. So what you would do is based on your stream volumes, you can add or reduce the shards. So you right size uh, your uh, streams to capture the uh, real-time data that is flowing in. And it can be thousands of sources that it can connect to and pull the data. It can be website click streams, financial transactions, social media feeds, IT logs, or location tracking events. Okay, so the data collected is available in milliseconds uh, to enable real-time analytics use case, such as real-time dashboards. Now, this can a typical use case can be building a leaderboard for a gaming platform where uh, you would like to know who's, who's actually uh, leading in a particular game and what is it that you would like to offer them um, to increase their retention rates, et cetera. Or a real-time anomaly detection and uh, get flagged up when there is an anomaly detected uh, through uh, notification serv services like SNS and uh, SNS or Pinpoint. And uh, dynamic pricing is available as well for Kinesis data streams. And uh, the other service that you that's available under the uh, Amazon Kinesis is Firehose. So it's the easiest way. It, it's like a delivery pipeline where you can drop in your drop data to S3 or Elasticsearch service. So once the data is available on either of these, uh, or and also uh, Redshift, it also supports the Redshift endpoint. So once data is available on these services, you can uh, start enabling real-time analytics with existing business intelligence tools and dashboards that you already have connected to these uh, uh, existing services, or just enable search, which can be embedded into your uh, existing applications. And uh, it can also do uh, batch, compress, and transforms. Now think about a use case where you would like to transform your data, which is uh, in, in real time, before it moves to a point where uh, you are uh, putting it uh, to use through the BI tools or the dashboards. So you would like to uh, transform it or aggregate it or uh, use windows for uh, data, which is uh, uncapped data where you would like to merge or aggregate it. So then that's possible with, um, you, can in, uh, M you can connect it with the Lambda, your Kinesis Firehose can integrate with Lambda functions. So you can design your custom uh, transformation logic on the Lambda function. Or you can also use Kinesis Data Analytics, which uh, with KDA, you can actually create your own uh, SQL queries to process the data, right? Uh, OK, let's move on and talk about what are the different customers who have benefited from these uh, Kinesis, uh, Amazon Kinesis services. So here is uh, the next door. It's a neighborhood hub for trusted connections and the exchange for helpful information, which can be goods and services. So what they've done is uh, with the Kinesis data analytics uh, for Apache Flink, uh, they were able to uh, help their customers build better connections. So since uh, so this actually brings in the data from uh, their uh, connected uh, systems. With KDA, uh, the uh, next door was able to create uh, simple uh, queries, which were able to provide uh, recommendations to the users and also uh, help them discover uh, local businesses and offers. And uh, that allowed, helped them to connect people with similar interests. Right, uh, this is another analytics service. It's uh, Amazon Elasticsearch has been renamed to Amazon Open Search Service. It's, uh, uh, it's a managed Elasticsearch service, so where you create a cluster, uh, and uh, each of these clusters has nodes, 
which uh, are where your uh, an elastic open source elastic search is uh, deployed and it helps uh, as you know uh, the elastic search service it allows companies to search explore filter aggregate and visualize the data in near real time now typically think of a use case where you have a product catalog um, or you have uh, an it logs which which is the uh, customer activity or which can be the developer or the admin activity that is carried on within an enterprise and you would like to be uh, notified if there is an um, if there is an anomaly detected or if there is an increase in the uh, network uh, bandwidth etc so that's where you can bring in the elastic search service right elastic search is a fully managed uh, service where you can deploy your production cluster uh, in a in few minutes and with new features like ultra warm you can actually uh, leverage s3 as your uh, storage layer so your log queries or your uh, customer queries uh, or the search are actually hitting s3 uh, which is the, uh, the the cost efficient storage choice that we have and which will bring down your uh, overall uh, elastic search consumption cost by 90% that's uh, elastic our uh, open search service with uh, ultra warm nodes and if uh, and it also uh, with auto with future features like auto tune it will allow you to uh, it will based on your consumption uh, and the traffic rates uh, it will right size your cluster so uh, adding nodes or reducing nodes just to meet the demand of uh, how your consumption patterns are okay so here we have uh, a, a customer who has uh, incorporated uh, open search service it's a popular um, application that we all know pinterest uh, which was primarily using uh, uh, open search service for log search and analytics it's a visual social networking platform and it was burdened by high overhead of using self managed elastic search that's a self hosted elastic search on their uh, existing servers and it was required to serve uh, daily logging and monitoring the platform switched to a proprietary third party elastic search solution but found it to be very expensive that's when they moved to fully managed uh, amazon open search service uh, which actually allowed them to reduce their operational burdens and reducing their tco cost uh, by uh, cost by around 30% and obviously taking care of scalability uh, monitoring and alerting productivity and security so you can create your cluster within a vpc uh, and ensure it's completely uh, private that that's the benefit of uh, amazon fully managed uh, open search service let's talk about amazon emr now uh, we have seen the serverless service now how about creating your own cluster and uh, also ensuring you create both a choice of on demand and spot instances that way even as you scale to processing uh, terabytes or petabytes of data you still uh, have a tab on managing your costs and ensuring you uh, you are complete your uh, infrastructure is completely cost efficient and then uh, yet you uh, take the benefit of the open source uh, projects that are available in the market so that's where uh, amazon emr can help you so if for a big data processing that where you're using hadoop or spark frameworks amazon managed service that makes it easy fast and cost efficient to process vast amounts of data across dynamically scalable amazon ec2 instances and emr actually supports 21 different open source projects including hadoop spark edge based uh, presto hive and many more uh, each project is updated in emr within 30 days of when you see an open open source version release so that's way that way you ensuring our customers get the latest and the greatest which is available uh, from the community and uh, it it takes only uh, so to upgrading from the existing cluster to the uh, the new cluster to take benefit of the new version of release uh, you can do that in few minutes with a version upgrade and it allows you to do uh, a mix of both on demand plus spot instances 
ensuring you to keep ensuring to keep the overall uh, cost low now think about a workload where you do not want to run it all the time and it just needs to be um, uh, training a model and then uh, shut down the clusters when it's not needed so you can exactly do that with amazon emr and you can use uh, apache airflow or uh, uh, step functions uh, allowing you to orchestrate the entire workflow for emr so it can start from creating a cluster deploy a new version of your job from your git git repository run the job uh, publish the results onto your uh, rds or s3 and then shut down the cluster so this entire pipeline can be designed on an airflow or uh, uh, using the step functions from the aws platform let's look at a customer use case uh, which is uh, nelson marketing cloud nmc it's a data management platform it creates marketing segments and has device graphs from a sea of audience data for customers to help them run and manage marketing campaigns NMC is a cloud native uh, um, software where it was the team was collecting around 60 terabytes of data every day and it was stores around 5 petabytes of data and the team uses apache spark heavily running about 6000 apache spark nodes uh, per day across all the clusters now the problem was the data scientists were uh, uh, use the data in the warehouse to build the models and run analytics and do research and because not all the data was available in the warehouse, they were actually relying on the developers who, 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 had, uh, who had to write custom reports and pull the data uh, using Apache Spark. So that kind of uh, increased our, uh, our increased friction, which also uh, added oper operational bottlenecks. And the solution was the development team wanted to remove the third-party data warehouses and give users direct access to the data sitting in the Amazon S3. Uh, without uh, compromising on the performance. That was possible uh, with uh, uh, Apache Spark over Amazon EMR. Now, we saw from the previous slide that EMR allows you to actually separate your compute with your storage. Now, here with data sitting on S3, uh, and uh, the developers actually implemented Apache Spark over EMR that acquired all of the uh, off-shelf uh, features that EMR provides and including cost tagging, uh, team uses for cost management, the Apache Zeppelin, which uses, give users a, a studio for running the SQL, and Apache Spark's Thrift server, which gives users a Java database uh, connectivity access. Right? That, that's a, a use case covering both Amazon EMR and also uh, S3. Another service in the analytics platform is Athena. So it now this is a completely serverless service. It's uh, managed Presto, which allows you to run interactive queries uh, from the data that is on S3 and any other uh, uh, database that is available on the AWS platform. So it allows what is called as federated querying. So now let's talk about your data, which is sitting in DynamoDB or uh, or uh, sitting in RDS or Aurora, and you would like to query and combine it with the data that is hosted on S3. You could do that uh, with uh, simple SQL joins. And that's possible with uh, Athena. It, it's a completely serverless service, which allows uh, you to just focus on your queries and your application logic. And there's no infrastructure to manage, and you pay only for the queries that you run. So it actually uh, charges for the scan data that uh, there will be uh, data uh, scan data per query, and you do not have to pay anything for the uh, in underlying infrastructure. Amazon Redshift, which is the warehousing uh, uh, service on the AWS platform, it provides the ability to run complex analytical queries against petabytes of structured data, includes Redshift Spectrum that run SQL queries directly uh, uh, on um, the data that is hosted on S3. Exabytes of structured and unstructured data that can, that can sit in S3, and yet you can query it and combine it with the associated data that is already on your uh, Redshift cluster. Now think of it this way, where you're creating, uh, where you understand uh, your data, and uh, you know that a certain part of your data is live or dynamic or it's uh, changing frequently 
Well, while the certain part of your data, which is your reference data, archival data, or your customer information or demographics, which doesn't change much. Uh, so you can store this on S3 and put your live data on Redshift, yet you can still combine them uh, and uh, you can create a simple SQL joins to generate uh, analytics and your analyst can actually uh, uh, query both of these data just the way it would have existed on uh, an associated storage with Redshift. And there are uh, a couple of releases that uh, went live uh, on the Redshift service which allow you to uh, keep your costs low, pause and resume. So when you're not using your warehouse cluster, you can actually uh, pause it and you do not get charged for the cluster. And you can resume it back when uh, during your business hours. And you can, if you are uh, a business with uh, different consumers from third party services or different lines of businesses, you can use uh, the data sharing option where you just store your data uh, uh, on one of the clusters, yet query it from the other clusters. And um, yeah, so with Redshift, customers can actually st uh, start small for just uh, 25 uh, cents per hour with no commitments and scale out to petabytes of data for 1,000 terabytes per year. That's less than a tenth of the cost for traditional solutions. Now, let's look at one of the customers. Now, uh, Wire Medical is a medical device manufacturer that creates respiratory equipment supporting ventilation, airway management, and operative care. And uh, we know uh, in the challenging times, it was essential to uh, capture the uh, metric settings coming out from these ventilators and pass it on to uh, medical advisors or doctors who can react to the situation in the right time where they can take a look and uh, give the right assistance at the right time. Uh, so here, a wire was actually using Redshift, QuickSight, and Elasticsearch service. Um, and uh, with and this act and uh, it became increasingly important to uh, scale uh, to scale out um, and actually to meet the demand due to COVID nineteen pandemic. And uh, this uh, this way, uh, with using the, uh, the services on the AWS platform, they were able to uh, fulfillment of the 60,000 ventilators in three months, and uh, which actually uh, provides a centralized visibility to over 500 stakeholders who are uh, constantly having uh, an eye on these, the data that is coming out on these dashboards, and which is uh, completely uh, real time. Right. Let, let's talk about uh, another use case, which is Playrix. It boosts, uh, so how did uh, actually uh, warehouse solution Redshift uh, that helped them to uh, scale out and uh, look at the, the play activity uh, on their interface. So this is a use case where uh, we have uh, the gaming users uh, to speed up the analytical querying capabilities with uh, minimal bottlenecks. Uh, Player is actually uh, a mobile gaming platform. It's well known for uh, games uh, like Township, Fishdom, Garden Spaces, Home Spaces. Um, so that that's available on uh, App Store. And uh, Playrix has actually built its backend on AWS using uh, EC2 uh, compute for compute capacity, S3 for storage, and it uses open source SQL query engine. Uh, but it had uh, issues in terms of uh, accuracy, scaling, uh, et cetera. And then that's where they uh, moved to a managed service, enabling the, them to uh, generate uh, insights out of the data or uh, with, with simple uh, SQL queries that they were able to port from their existing SQL and uh, turn them into a compatible format that can be run on uh, Redshift. The benefits were they were able to store up to five terabytes of data from their marketing partners and uh, reduce the overall bottlenecks, uh, calculate two to three years of data history in hours versus weeks. Okay, so we have seen uh, different layers of bringing in your data to the point where you turn it into, uh, where you uh, pass it through analytical services. And then talking about the consumption endpoints, which can be visualization and machine learning solutions now, there can be uh, other endpoints as well, which can be uh, your, uh, serving your application through a Lambda function, 
uh, via an API endpoint. Though the possibilities can be different. So we are talking about visualization and machine learning in this case. Uh, talking about dashboards, we uh, Amazon QuickSight is one service, which uh, is a, uh, which provides a fast and cloud-powered business analytics service uh, that makes it easy to build stunning visualizations and rich dashboards that can be accessed from any browser or mobile device. Now, this allows you to create uh, embedded uh, dashboards, both anonymized embedding, uh, which is like creating public dashboards uh, where you can embed them into your existing uh, um, URLs or your existing uh, websites and ensure it's it's completely uh, f uh, serving the refresh set of data. So that's possible with anonymous embedding. Or you have your authorized set of users who need who just need to access the uh, dashboard. That's with the authorized embedding option. And it allows you to create end-to-end uh, -end BI solutions. And uh, it, you do not have to pay any upfront costs, uh, no licensing. Uh, it's, it's completely, um, you're not going to pay for any hardware. Rather, you're going to pay for based on a usage-based model, right? How does that help? So here you're actually creating uh, the interactive dashboards, um, which supports the existing charts, uh, which can be uh, your uh, bar charts, pie charts, donuts, and uh, also uh, it's a growing space. So we keep adding new features and uh, to support different sorts of metrics uh, to match different segments from medical to energy sector, um, or your fintech or fintech industry. So, and you can uh, both uh, rely on uh, the in-memory DB, which is called Spice, uh, which allows you for allows millisecond latency uh, response uh, for the for the data associated with these dashboards. Or you can also uh, rely on uh, connecting to your uh, data sources from the platform. And it can actually allow you to connect to the databases on the platform and also external services like your uh, Salesforce, where you want to bring in uh, data about your uh, data about your uh, product that you would like to combine with your live data and uh, publish a dashboard. That's completely possible. Or uh, any on-premise data uh, store can also be connected to QuickSight. Uh, to query and uh, create visualizations. So uh, we see the machine learning stack having uh, three different uh, key layers. So that's where you create uh, ML frameworks, the bottom layer for expert machine learning practitioners, researchers, and developers. So these are the people who are comfortable building new models, tuning models, training, feature engineering, et cetera, and then publish the models from which can be later used for inferencing. Uh, so an, an infrastructure, it's, uh, it's um, so here AWS offers a broad range of compute uh, options for training and inferencing with powerful GPU-based instances, compute and memory optimized, and even uh, FPGAs. And there are other ML services where you do not need any uh, ML expertise or not need to um, have any data scientists within your organization. Rather, these are managed ML services where you can just plug into your uh, source and uh, use the, uh, utilize the, uh, the pre-built models uh, for inferencing. Now, these can be uh, ML services like recognition, personalize, uh, transcribe, translate, or creating chatbots with legs where uh, the heavy lifting is completely taken over and uh, you are having a trained uh, model available that can plug into your source and uh, generate uh, your ML insights. AI services, uh, which at top of the AI services, which are ready-made for all developers, and there's no ML skills required. Uh, so for example, customers say, here is an object, tell me what's in it. And that's uh, a face recognition. Um, it can work with both your uh, images and also video. So that's the, and it's part of the facial group using Amazon recognition. Or let, uh, let me translate text to speech with Amazon Polly. Let's build conversational apps with Amazon Lex or convert speech to text with Amazon Transcribe and translate between the languages using Amazon Translate. Now, uh, 
you must be aware of uh, the uh, the personalization service which is a popular service which is all, uh, which is used in amazon prime that helps uh, to personalize content for the users based on the previous uh, clicks or activity on the platform that that's uh, using a completely uh, managed ml service that allows you to uh, plug in to your uh, existing application without having any uh, machine learning expertise okay let me move on and talk about one of the customers uh, capital one uh, they were using uh, so what they needed was to have a self service analytics on uh, the data lake so uh, the quick site was uh, incorporated into their uh, infrastructure stack the quicksight actually allows uh, the uh, heterogeneous and homogeneous access uh, to the uh, data sets now which can be your data that is coming in from s3 to a structured data that is coming in from your rds so you can create a uh, simple dashboards with few clicks uh, using quicksight and it's a fully managed service so there is no downtime associated and uh, you do not you wouldn't need even developers to create these dashboards so it's it's available you can create the entire dashboard uh, within a few cl few clicks so uh, the capital one was actually using uh, a warehouse and uh, connecting to their uh, transactional store uh, which is on rds and uh, their existing uh, Snow, uh, warehouse service snowflake um, and, and connecting uh, and querying the data through Athena and passing the results of the query to QuickSight for visualization. Let's see a uh, few other reference architectures uh, incorporating the services we have spoken about so far. Now, uh, I'm going to talk you through actually two uh, different uh, architectures. Uh, just to ensure we are covering uh, the wide range of use cases that, that might fit in these two architectures. So one of them is for batch. The other one will be uh, a streaming or a real-time use case. And in batch, if you see the ex uh, where we are bringing in the data from your files or your uh, on-premise data stores and land your data on uh, S3, then you use a glue job to uh, transform and move the data to a processed S3 bucket. From where you can use the uh, serverless Athena service to query the data on the uh, the target S3 bucket and pass it on to a quick site to build uh, simple visualizations. Now this is uh, an end-to-end -end pipeline for your batch processing, and with and as you observe these uh, both Glue or uh, S3 or Quick site and Athena, these are completely serverless services. So you do not have to uh, manage and uh, or create any clusters or nodes uh, to run your operations on top of these service. Similarly, um, in this, uh, we are talking about here, I'm referring to um, a streaming use case here, which is bringing data from your uh, connected devices or click stream activity from your end users through a mobile interface. That, that's an example. Or an IoT data is actually a great example where an always-on system provides continuous sensor data, but the analytics is on demand. And that's the difference when you uh, compare it to the batch. And you pay for those services only when you use them. So here, as you see, uh, we are bringing in the data from Kinesis uh, using a Kinesis data stream, passing it through uh, other set of Kinesis services, Kinesis data analytics. And you can also use Firehose, which is our delivery pipeline to land your data on S3, and then uh, use uh, the other uh, uh, serverless services, which is your Glue, uh, create a complete entire workflow, bring in, uh, extract the schema, or verify this landing schema, and then pass it on to your uh, consumption-ready uh, uh, data layer, which can be your uh, destination S3 bucket, from where it can be uh, picked up by uh, a from there where it can be picked up by Athena for querying or it can also be uh, your SageMaker model uh, for a training purpose. So, Or you can connect it to your Elasticsearch service where it, should, where it is serving the customers uh, for a full text search or, 
uh, for a full text search or creating uh, visualizations. Okay, now here's uh, Amazon.com. Now we, Amazon builds and operate thousands of microservices to serve millions of customers. These include catalog browsing, order placement, transaction processing, delivery scheduling, video services. That's a lot happening. And if, if, you, uh, if you would uh, want to understand the massive scale of the data that is handled, it includes uh, over 50 petabytes of data and 75,000 tables processing over 1 million uh, user analytic jobs every single day. Now, the challenge was uh, with on-premise database infrastructure that supported the system was not designed to process uh, petabytes of data. Obviously, when you uh, design your in initial systems, uh, they need to scale from terabytes to petabytes. So it, it was resulted in a monolithic solution that was hard to maintain and operate due to lack of separation of concerns from both the functional and financial perspective, right? And that is where uh, the new data lake based solution utilizing a variety of AWS services to deliver performance and reliability for uh, at exabyte scale uh, for data processing and streaming and analytics, uh, which comprised of uh, S3 service, Amazon EMR, Redshift, and uh, with EMR, uh, it was provides a managed uh, Hadoop framework, as we all know, we have seen that in the previous slide. So here, uh, Amazon.com was leveraging EMR with uh, Edgeways, uh, Presto, and Flink, and uh, also the um, the instances uh, with uh, Amazon EC2. Uh, and uh, to run uh, Amazon Redshift is uh, was also used for as a warehouse service, uh, and interactive uh, visualizations were built using Amazon QuickSight. That way, actually, it resulted uh, it, uh, with the double storage capacity and uh, lowering the costs. And uh, with, with cloud, it's actually completely scalable. So you do not have to pre-provision any hardware to manage your uh, growing uh, needs of your business. Right. So as you create your uh, infrastructure stack on the AWS platform, we have other supporting services that allow you to uh, create and they allow you to uh, enhance the security, ensure end-to-end uh, -end data encryption, both at rest and in transit, detective control, and also incident response in case of uh, in case of an abnormal activity where you need to be flagged up and your uh, team needs to respond. So that's a. Uh, as you can see, these are uh, there are a lot of services which have been listed on uh, the slide. Uh, the, uh, there are certain regulatory compliance when uh, your application needs to adhere to when you're operating in the market, and which could be PCI DSS compliance, uh, which is your payment card industry standard when you're handling uh, customer data uh, for uh, when you're handling customer data, or the SOC compliance with the uh, service organization controls. AWS Artifact provides several compliance reports issued by third-party auditors who have tested and verified our compliance with a variety of global, regional, and industry-specific security standards and regulations. Right, so let's check a, a, a live demo, which is actually pre-built. So uh, I'm going to also share the uh, material and the links where you can also create these demo uh, into your AWS accounts. Um, so you can take a look as to how easy and simple it is to um, uh, create an end-to-end -end pipeline. A customer uh, insights, uh, which is uh, coming from the uh, user clicks. Uh, this is a click stream based on the click stream activity. Uh, it's a very common use case. That's the reason um, I've uh, thought this uh, this is a better use case uh, to present in this session, uh, which can be relatable to any segment be it medical, be it fintech, or banking, where you have a mobile or a web interface, and a customer is actually looking for uh, different products, and uh, and throughout through different clicks, you would like to understand uh, his or her journey, and uh, serve him serve them better uh, with the products uh, that you have that you're currently available, or uh, with the upcoming set of choices that you can offer to the customer, or just use it for marketing purposes. Right, so here it is. Uh, let me talk you through the architecture first. 
so while I'm running through the demo, um, you can visualize uh, these uh, services and understand uh, how the flow is. So you would see at, at the left hand side, there's a stream creators, uh, which is actually uh, simulating the real time clicks, uh, which is uh, performed by the user. And in this case, uh, you would see me, um, uh, uh, you would see uh, you would see the demo and demonstration, which is picking up the data from a product ordering website. So the, the activity would typically look like um, uh, look at the list of the catalog of the products, choose your product, add it to the cart, and then pro proceed towards the checkout. So that that's generally what we do on on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, different ordering websites or uh, apps. Um, so it, so let, let's see how it works. So here we have Kinesis Data Streams, which is connecting to your stream connectors. And uh, it's picking up the source data as it arrives. And then we're passing it through Kinesis Data Analytics. And here you would see that there is a uh, few aggregations because uh, on that is happening on the data. We are, we are trying to uh, turn it into uh, an enriched format where it can be passed down the, um, the consuming uh, endpoints. So if we, and then we are uh, using Kinesis Firehose. There's also another Lambda function so in case you would like to, uh, on the aggregated data, if you would like to perform any other transformations, you can incorporate them in that Lambda function here, right? And then the Firehose service, which is which delivers the data onto an S3 target bucket, which uh, from where it becomes uh, available for Athena to run your queries. And uh, in the CloudWatch, you would see the real-time dashboard uh, that's uh, actually showing you how the stream of events are flowing in and also uh, where, where you can actually set few alarms uh, just to be notified so that's possible with the uh, cloud watch and you can uh, and we here we'll be using glue here because uh, for the data that is arriving we just we want to un understand what is the schema associated with the data and also uh, in if we would like to perform any transformations on the data that can be uh, incorporated in a glue job, and you can create a complete workflow that can uh, that can be triggered after the data lands in S3. And then uh, we're going to end by creating a visualization, a complete a dashboard that will uh, help you understand uh, the customer activity, uh, which is turning into a, a meaningful dashboard, uh, which is more readable uh, by uh, any common user or your marketing or your business users. In, and let's see how it works. OK, so here I am on um, uh, AWS console. And uh, here uh, you would see, um, let me go to the Lambda functions. So from the architecture, if you remember, we are actually creating a stream of data, which is simulating a real use case, uh, which, is like, which is a customer uh, activity. OK, let me show you the function. That's the code. And uh, you would see the activity uh, uh, so that is getting generated. Uh, so it, it comes with a user ID, uh, a randomly generated user ID, just to ensure we are uh, uniquely associating uh, each user with an ID. And the device, which can be your mobile, computer, tablet, uh, et cetera, from where the user is interacting. And the client event. So we spoke about the uh, activities uh, that is performed on a on an ordering website. So here we're talking about a checkout, a product detailing from the catalog, a selection, and adding it to the cart. So these are the typical set of events, and uh, you would see a stream getting generated based on this uh, data format. Okay, so let's see. Um, if the data is getting generated, I'm, I'm on the CloudWatch dashboard for the Lambda function. Um, yeah, as you can see, there is there is some activity and the data has been flowing in. Right, uh, if you click from the architecture, so the session data has been uh, will, is being moved to Kinesis data streams. Now I'm on the Kinesis uh, service. So here you can see the session clicks, which is active. Let me also show you the dashboard. 
uh, with the metrics of the data that is uh, flowing in yeah that that's the uh, data the incoming uh, data records and the bytes associated with the data okay some more interesting metrics on the latency and the overall uh, records that are uh, flowing in and the bytes of data incoming data etc which is available on the streams and if you click from the slides uh, that i've uh, spoken about on the streams you can uh, increase the size of your stream if there is more inflow of records so that way you can um, you are actually accommodating your stream to pick up the increasing set of uh, streams through by increasing or reducing the shards associated with the stream right so after streams let's the data is moving to kinesis data analytics and yeah you can see this the status is running it has been picking up the data uh, which is coming through the lambda function through the kinesis stream streams into the analytics uh, let me actually show you how the data looks like okay now this is an a sql core uh, which you can uh, run to query the data that has been flowing in and uh, here actually kinesis data analytics if you remember uh, so it's it actually allows you it it's includes more than 25 pre-built uh, stream processing operations like windowing and aggregations now for an uncapped or an unbounded data set it is uh, impossible to collect all of the elements and you are you going to uh, what you're going to do is you design strategies around aggregating this uh, uh, data uh, aggregating this unbounded data and how do you do that so that's uh, if you're working with an unbounded p collection uh, yeah, windowing is especially useful and kinesis data analytics actually supports uh, sliding windows tumbling windows and staggering windows that's the aggregation logics that you can incorporate in your sql uh, to collect and curate the data before it's passed on to uh, visualize or generate analytics right uh, KA actually, or Kinesis Data Analytics, it's uh, it has 25 pre-built stream processing operators, so it can support not just not just windows and aggregations, and uh, um, it there are uh, windows and aggregation. It has other uh, pre-built uh, stream processing operations that it can support. And once you once built, you can upload your code to KDA, uh, and the uh, service takes care of everything. So be it from required to run your real-time applications continuously including uh, scaling automatically to meet the volume and the throughput of your incoming need. So what you do is essentially uh, um, in configure incoming streaming data, write your SQL queries, point to where the results should be loaded. So here in this case, if you see, uh, yeah, there is a, a preview SQL which is running on the data. I'm going to show you uh, the source stream which has been moving to the Kinesis data analytics. So just see what's there in the incoming data so there's a session id if you recollect from the lambda function there was a, a unique session id user id device id and we are uh, aggregating it uh, aggregating the data that is flowing in and what are the events associated with it and as you can see it's changing real time because the new set of data has been is continuously flowing in and the navigation activities uh, from beer selection to um, ending the navigation event and what is the overall duration uh, associated with this activity right that that's all the data that is flowing in and then since the stream is active uh, you're actually getting the live data um, as we speak as well and that's the uh, output that we have seen uh, which is actually uh, an aggregated window so here uh, we are using a staggered uh, window where we are collect collecting the data and partitioning it by user ID, device, device ID, and the client timestamp. And it's 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 for a range of one minute, and it's uh, it's configurable. You can change this duration. Okay, I don't want it completely for a per minute. Maybe I'll I'll change it for five minutes. So you could do those modification and rerun your uh, queries uh, to ensure your windows are running at the five minutes timeline. And uh, that's the output. Look at, let's look at the input that is coming on from the stream. Okay. Yeah, this is the input. If you see, uh, yeah, it, it's again the similar set of data, uh, with, but it's it's more raw. 
as you see. Uh, so it's, it's straight away the fields that are coming in from the lambda function. And while in the output, they were aggregated uh, per minute and partitioned as well. Okay, what's happening next is once we have these set of events, uh, we are using uh, what is as a glue crawler. Now, I've spoken about this a couple of times uh, during the session where uh, glue will is a the serverless service will actually help you create your crawler jobs or your ETL jobs uh, where you do not need to provision any server. You just you can, can it's based on the Spark uh, framework and it allows you to run your codes uh, both on Python and Scala. Uh, so here is a crawler uh, which has been uh, uh, deployed and it's uh, active. You can schedule the crawler to run uh, based on the duration on a day or even at on an hourly basis, and uh, and then it would what it will do is it will scan through the data which is actually coming in through your stream or which is hosted on your S3 bucket, and it will generate what is called as these schemas, right? So the column name, the data type associated, and what are the partitions? So based on the folders where it is actually storing your data on S3 bucket, it can partition your data uh, on the fly when it is scanning uh, through the data sets, right? So here you would see there are certain partitions it has detected. And once you can, you are happy with the schema, yes, this is actually uh, matching with the existing uh, source data that I have created. You can go ahead or you can actually edit the schema as well here and then save it right so once we have uh, our, our tables are available we have our data that is associated uh, let's move ahead and uh, see how we can query them on uh, let me actually open athena and show you how the data looks like Okay. Now, it allows you to connect to your data source. Now, this can be your S3 bucket or query any other data source which is on the platform. Or you can connect to create your own data connectors through via a Lambda function. Right? And here in this case, uh, since we are landing our stream of data on an S3 bucket, and then we are uh, querying it through uh, querying it through a, a data that is hosted on S3 plus the schema from the catalog. And it also gives you a choice of uh, saving your catalog, uh, saving your schemas on Apache Hive Metastore, which can also be chosen for uh, reading out your table schemas. But here we are, uh, our idea was to create a complete uh, a serverless uh, pipeline. Uh, so just to uh, let you understand how easy uh, within Few, within few minutes, you can actually create an end-to-end -end active pipeline. Okay, going back, let me show you the data. Okay, so I've connected to the data source. This is actually the database where, uh, this is actually the database uh, from the glue catalog. And once I select that, you can see the tables that are available here, the aggregated data, the raw data, Right. Let, let's go ahead and uh, query. Yeah, I'm just doing a preview with uh, 10 lines of data. Yep, that's the same. Uh, it uh, We can associate it with the stream that we have seen on Kinesis Data Analytics. So here uh, it's the device, client ID, yeah, and it's the same activity. And as you can see, uh, based on the schema that is available on the uh, glue, you can see the partitions have also been uh, pulled out. Okay, because it's saving the data in different folders on the S3 bucket. Okay, so what do we do next? Let's, let's take that data uh, further, move on and generate some dashboards. I'm on the quick site. Uh, okay, I'm on the quick site service on the AWS console. Now this allows you to connect to different data sources. Uh, this is the point a place where you can add data sets. So you can create a new data set, uh, which can be a new data source, which uh, you can upload it from your, uh, uh, from your com computer, your on-premise uh, service, uh, and store it on an uh, in-memory database, uh, in-memory DB, 
which is spice and uh, for this account uh, so this is an account which i have just created for the demo purpose uh, so you would see uh, a 1 gigabyte of spice capacity you can continue to add and increase the spice capacity depending on your in memory uh, dashboarding requirements so and also you can connect to your other data sources uh, within your enterprise like salesforce or if you have uh, any other uh, operational tools like uh, Jira, ServiceNow, um, you could do that too. Or um, obviously you can also connect to any of uh, the other data stores on the AWS platform, right? Okay, so once you create your data set, you can add it here. And then you start with your ana uh, creating analysis on top of the data set. Now here is, Okay, let it load. So this is a sample analytics which uh, I was uh, trying to create with the data that was connected to Athena. So here, as you see, it's it's our raw data and aggregated data. So this is actually data sets created on top of the Athena uh, data set. So you can change them. No, okay, I would like to uh, create some visuals on top of the aggregated data set. Uh, just choose that data set and you have the fields available. Uh, so, and uh, click on add visual that, that, that will create a new, uh, that will create a new visual type, choose your visual type, uh, which can be a bar chart or, uh, bar chart tables or, uh, comparison charts, aggregation charts, tabular views, uh, for using pivot tables. Uh, or correlation using scatter plots, et cetera. Okay, and okay, let, let's see uh, what, what we can see from the data. Now, if you see the first chart here, it says that, um, yeah, most of the activity from the begin navigation, um, you, as you can see, it's equally distributed across uh, from the checkout to cart to selection and products. That, that's an <clears throat> useful information. Uh, but as we see, it's uh, completely distributed. So that's that may not give us uh, uh, much data about uh, where they are, where a customer is spending most of the time. For example, if we understand that yes, uh, during the checkout process, there's a maximum amount of overall duration in seconds, then which helps us understand that yes, uh, during the checkout process, customers are facing a difficulty. So maybe we should make it more user friendly, and so users can uh, change. Uh, users should be able to check out uh, and finish their complete activity uh, in in uh, reducing the overall time. And let's look at the another uh, uh, visual here, which says uh, the duration in second seconds compared to the events. Now we know the devices are mobile, tablet, and computer, and as you can see, uh, mobile is the uh, the device which is of choice uh, for the end users and which is quite obvious we know we are uh, we, we prefer using our mobile for ordering uh, food or um, ordering uh, through our product applications so that that's a uh, interesting insight and if you want your tabular data um, just pull out the entire set of the data, data that is coming in now this is for your uh, business users who just want to take a look uh, on the entire set of data or just extract it and take it forward uh, as a CSV or email it and export it and share it as a report. So once you publish your dashboard, uh, give it a name. Okay, let's product flow, publish the dashboard. And it'll take you to a point where these dashboards are available uh, on a published view page. And you can see uh, you can add your uh, users who need to receive this particular uh, dashboard, right? Now that's that's me. Uh, so I can add users uh, on the quick site uh, control, and then I can send those reports. So let me show you how you can do that. You go to manage quick site. So you have your manage users. So you can invite new users and uh, assign permissions to them. So when you invite users, add the uh, user IDs uh, and assign permissions from admin to uh, viewer to developers, right? 
Okay. And uh, yeah, there are other important aspects here, adding your in-memory DB through a spice capacity or uh, creating a complete uh, private connection. So you are connecting to your maybe an RDS uh, MySQL server from where you are running your queries. You can keep, make the entire connection private by adding a VPC or a subnet connection associated with the uh, associated with the database and uh, the quick site. Embeddings. Now, this is an interesting uh, use case where you would like to, uh, yeah. And another important aspect of QuickSight is, uh, is you can generate, once uh, you load your data connected to your data sets, uh, QuickSight can generate few insights for you. So, based on the data that it scans, right? So here, it, it, this, these are the uh, insights which uh, QuickSight things are may, may be of uh, value and which you can directly go and add it to your da dashboard, right? So that's the total aggregation of duration. So yeah, you can see, yes, that's the total duration in seconds uh, of the overall activity for all the users across different devices. Let's see if there's anything interesting. Um, bottom three devices, we have only three devices in our test data. Okay, bottom three navigations, maybe, okay. Uh, yeah, this might be of value. I am going to add this to the dashboard too. So let me drag it and put it. Okay, right. This is actually a reputation, so I'm gonna take it and I'm going to stretch this a bit. Yeah, maybe a better looking dashboard. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. Okay, so this is, if I I just want to drag it to the point where all the data is visible. Okay, let's pull this down. Yeah, right. Okay, so we have in within few clicks, you can actually create this dashboard, get it published and share with your uh, external users as well so that's uh, and also let me um, okay share with your external users and you can also create insights which um, uh, insights uh, which can be your forecast on top of the data now if you have a time series data and you would like to understand a prediction based on the current level of consumption and how is it going to be at a later point of time you can create ML-powered uh, insights uh, and also detect anomalies uh, based on the current consumption patterns or if you detect there is any change or a deviation and you would like to uh, understand uh, the anomaly points, you can do that with the anomaly detection powered insight as well. Right, so, okay. So let me also cover a few of the features which are part of the quick site since we are, uh, this is a demo central link um, which has been published by the product team. So uh, there are some interesting uh, features on uh, quick site. Uh, so let me show. There's certain interesting features that I would like to share with you. Uh, and this is the demo central link, which has been published by the QuickSight uh, product team. And uh, here it is. So QuickSight Q. Now think about users who do not want to take a look at the dashboards and uh, understand the performance of your product. Rather, they would just want to pose a few questions. Uh, so QuickSight can actually scan through the available data and uh, give you the responses. For example, let's see who within Amazon has spent the most. 
So you can pose a question, uh, which is actually using the uh, natural language uh, processing in the background to understand the intent behind the question and scan through the data uh, before publishing the results. So this is uh, relevant data associated with the query. Uh, so that's the orders and the names of uh, who on Amazon have actually spent the most and the quantity and the sum associated with it. This feature is currently in preview, uh, should be uh, announced uh, GA soon. OK. Right, so um, yeah, after Q, uh, let's look at another important feature, which is embedding your third demo. So you can actually embed your entire dashboard um, into your existing uh, portal. So, and you can do that in both ways uh, for uh, anonymous set of users who, for public viewing, or ensure author, author, authenticated users have just the right access. Uh, you can give them an author view, a dashboard view, or a reader view, and have a control as to what is the activity they can do on your dashboard, which is modifying your data sets and the visuals on your already published dashboards. So you can do that by giving them the uh, right access on the dashboard. Right? So, yeah. Um, that actually brings us to the end of the session. Yeah. Hope you found the demo useful. Uh, so, I'm also going to share uh, reference materials and key links uh, along with the uh, links for the demonstration. So, with the stepwise instructions that you can try out on your AWS account. And there are other useful information, uh, AWS blog, documentation, white papers, and guides that you can take a look um, according to your convenience. OK, uh, thanks for joining me. Um, let's see uh, what are the questions on the chat window.